Okay, then we can move on. So partially what we said this morning is like, okay, today we want to talk a little bit more about the pathophysiology, about some of the basic principles. We started with a talk more about the molecular part and how blood is behaving at some parts. Then we said we look at more like what's happening in cells, cell interactions. And although it's not direct flow, already it was said that you can use hydrodynamic mod models in order to look at this. And so now we want to go one step further and going again to the pathophysiology, but now a little bit closer to the clinic. And the idea is now to look a little bit more like, okay, when you do clinical measurements of hemodynamics, how can we assess things that are important from the point of view of physiology and clinics when looking at flow phenomena? And it's my pleasure to have Javier Bermejo here, who is the chief of non-invasive cardiology in Gregorio Marion Hospital in Madrid. But also, it's like besides being a clinical cardiologist, he's one of the only cardiologists that I know that likes to work with engineers and hires engineers and thinks that engineers are useful or might be useful at some point, at least to spend a little bit of money to. So, and he's really working on how can we get more out of clinical data where we, where we try to get hemodynamics in. So it's my pleasure to have you here. So, Thank you, Bart. Um, I'm definitely convinced we need to put engineers in the clinical field, 100% uh, no doubt. And uh, part of the things I'm going to show you th this morning is related to this approach we've always believed in for the last 10 years in, in Madrid. So um, I'm going to show you so, so kind of a perspective of the kind of research we've been doing, trying to, as Bart was uh, summarizing where well, the bottom line is what can we get out of the imaging uh, and signals you can get in the scanners you buy to the manufacturers what kind of information can you get out of it that is not directly provided by the by the scanners what kind of post-processing can aid the clinical fields and what kind of physiological information can be taken to the clinical perspective so it's very very clinically oriented I'm not going to very much of the f uh, f uh, uh, basic physics or basic physiology, but I really want to show you the way we organize our research from the technical part to the clinical applications in order to answer uh, common clinical problems. Probably you've all, all of you here have gone through this in the uh, med or pre-med or, I don't know, biological schools where the cardiac cycle is shown in this uh, pressure volume loop. Everyone understands this? Most of you? Yes? Make sure I know who I'm talking to. So act here you got the mitral valve closing, the heart, this is the left ventricular chamber. The left ventricle starts to contract, it builds up pressure without ejection volume, the aortic valve opens, then flow starts to come out, pressure starts to be built in the aorta, the volume comes smaller, then you get this part of the curve until ejection ends, you get the aortic valve closing, pressure suddenly drops through isovolumetric relaxation, and then once the pressure fall reaches atrial pressure, the mitral valve opens and the ventricle starts filling, right? This is a, what we call a lump parameter uh, integrative physiology of what's happening with a one single measure of pressure inside the chamber and volume inside the chamber, right? One single, we assume that the, there's no pressure gradient inside the ventricle, which we are, and later on I'll show you is obviously wrong, and we assume that there's only one measurement of volume for the full chamber. So that's the way we've learned physics, uh, physiology, we learned to assess ventricular fact function both in systole and diastole. Now, uh, obviously, this is very difficult, very, very difficult to, to assess in clinical practice. It's easy to measure end systolic and end diastolic volume. You can do this using uh, a bunch of techniques, mostly echocardiography and MRI in, in cardiovascular medicine. But if you want to get, you know, high temporal resolution to get a lot of measurements of what's going on volume, that's not that easy. And obviously, it's not that easy to place a pressure catheter inside the ventricle. You have to do a left heart catheterization procedure. So 
most of, uh, of uh, quite a lot of what I'm going to show you um, in my talk is trying to understand what this, how we can get this information out of things that we can do non-invasively and we can measure in patients in the clinical field. And most of the information is related to what's going on in intracardiac flows. And give, for the whole um, uh, summer school and the whole session devoted to flows, I wanted to focus everything I'm going to show you uh, and, and for, my, for my talk is related to what's going on with flow inside the heart, mostly inside the left and the right ventricles, and what are the consequences of that and what is the understanding. Nowadays, and tomorrow you'll have two lectures on how we can measure velocities inside the heart. We can measure this in 1D, 2D, 3D, and 3D and time, and 4D, and you can do this using echo with contrast, without contrast. You can do this with using MRI. Each technique has its advantages, has its, its drawbacks, but I'm not going to, going to go so much into the details of the techniques themselves, but a little bit more into the physiology and the processing. And the first thing you can see is that flow is very, very complex inside the heart, okay? Nature, you know, for the mammalian and the human heart, has made the, the chambers in a very complex uh, geometry, the way that flow follows very complex trajectories. And it's obviously um, uh, time, invariant, time variant, and, and things are, it's a very unsteady, and geometrically complex flow, so we have to try to make things as simple as possible. And this was the original paper brought up by a clinical guy in, in King's College in, in, in London. And if you look at flow in 2D, the way you can see it here, this is from his original paper, there are two parts of the picture we can say flow is mostly 1D, or kind of a tube. You see when the flow is coming from the left atrium to inside the ventricle, you see a column which is quite like a tube. And when the blood is being ejected from the LV apex out to the aorta, there you can see another sort of kind of 1D distribution if you just focus on exactly that particular com column of flow. And that's what we tried to bring up and we thought of if we could sort of focus at very specific locations of flow, at very specific instance of the cardiac cycle, there could be some uh, relevant information out there that could help us understand clinical problems. From the early 80s, these, have you ever heard of these Millar high, sensi high sensitive uh, pressure catheters, these microtransducers here? These are not regular catheters, as you can see in the uh, cath lab in, in any clinical hospital. The difference here is that the electronic transducer is sitting at the tip of the catheter, which provides much more accurate measurements of pressure at a specific location without the issues of damping or uh, low frequency response and so forth. So these uh, experiments done in the early 80s before the development of, of all these fancy imaging modalities, what they showed us is that there were physiologically relevant pressure gradients inside the heart right, even inside a single chamber. Due to the, this unsteadiness of flow, flow is changing through time and related to that inertia, as I'll share you, as you obviously know from basic physics, there are some small but um, uh, relevant pressure gradients br br being built throughout the cardiac cycle inside the heart, in the left and in the right uh, ventricles. And that is the first very simple information we tried to understand across the mitral valve here between the left atrium and the ventricle or in, uh, in between the LV apex and the outflow tract during ejection. See, one part of the cardiac cycle, another part, this is the filling phase, or even inside the heart between the apex and the mitral inflow that is also inside the ventricle but throughout diastole instead of systole or even in the right heart across the tricuspid valve. So what is the information you can think we can obtain by trying to measure those pressure gradients? Now, the first thing is, what is the best way to measure them? How, would, how can we deal with getting these pressure gradients out of imaging? So we did 
this was a, uh, an approach that came 20 years ago from Klimov Clinic. They gave us this approximation, which is pretty, pretty uh, straightforward from a simple 1D flow and steady Bernoulli equation and doing some very simple kernels. You could apply maths to the image and obtain the pressure distribution. We did a slightly different approach, which was doing some spline fitting and uh, again bringing up the couple of spatial and temporal derivatives. And now we get uh, an image, instead of depicting flow velocity, as we obtained from the ultrasound scanner, we obtain a pr uh, amount of pressure difference inside that specific uh, location, right? So this is a 1D flow from the LV apex to the outflow track, and this is the ejection phase. The blood is coming out from the apex towards the aortic valve, and this is the ejection phase, so that accelerates flow and produces this pressure gradient here from there to there, which eventually is reversed at the end of ejection. So the M mode, this, come, this is built by one single ultrasound line scanning with Doppler across this uh, uh, flow from the LV apex to the aorta. So this uh, color M mode, which is uh, in the ultrasound scanners for the last, uh, I would say, 30, 40 years, that gives us a very interesting map that you can do very simple maths. You only need to decode the velocities and do these derivatives and you obtain the pressure gradient fields and you can obviously do some spatial integration there and, give it and, and provide with the absolute millimeters of mercury between two locations in that specific pathway, right? So the first thing we did is, it was quite some years ago, say well, let's <coughs> validate this and see what is the use. So we did some micromanometer measurements and we also did this conductance catheter to obtain pressure and volume and obtain these uh, very um, accurate me measurements of pressure, volume, and these pressure gradient curves between this location. You see this is systole, the ejection being, uh, the blood being ejected. And here we've, this is the raw velocity as provided by the scanner and this is the pressure gradient obtained by processing and uh, merging both images. Now, we had some uh, modeling data and some uh, theoretical papers saying the more pressure you can build between the apex and your aorta, the better your systolic function, your pump function is working. So this ability of accelerate flow, of building pressure, is a good uh, measurement of overall systolic function in the chamber. So the better you can compress your fluid before being ejected or at the time of being ejected, the better your systolic function is. And getting this sort of uh, reference method of a very robust measurement, the, the holy grail of systolic function, something that really uh, reproduces the, the, the way of the, the left ventricle is contracting is something very, very important in, in cardiovascular medicine. Because obviously everything you is in vivo, everything is much more complicated than ex experimental lab, and everything is you know, affected by drugs, affected by uh, preload, by afterload, and trying to get something really robust, not dependent on loading conditions, is something that in cardiovascular diagnosis, we've all been be all, all, uh, looking for for a long time. And this is what we got. This is the gold standard. These are the pressure volumes you obtain during acute preload modifications and you get this family of curves as the, as the ventricle load is being, download, is, is being lowered and you see these slopes here, the, the, deep, the steeper your slope, the better your systolic function is as you can modulate using drugs. This is the baseline, this is a reduction of contractility, this is uh, increasing contractility by drugs and you get the different slopes here which account for different uh, Emacs which is this reference value for contractility and we got very similar responses for this pressure gradient. So we did these experimental animals in the, in, the, in the surgical room, these were pigs, and we did quite a number of experiments to demonstrate this, something we could bring out of the uh, conventional echo gave us a very robust measurement of systolic function and that correlated with very, very nice uh, uh, correlation whatever kind of interventions we did there. So this, first we brought up the method, we did the, the software, we went to the experimental lab, we made sure the gradients were measured accurately, we made sure we understood uh, 
what we were measuring and what did it account for. And then we, the next question was, what happens if we apply this into clinical practice? What is the information? What kind of questions can we answer in patients? So we needed to move to the, from the experimental lab to the clinical cath lab. And we did a small number of patients in, we, in which we did these pressure volumes in the cath lab to make sure the, the, the measurements were still accurate. And we got a quite uh, heterogeneous population there. We had patients with uh, um, chronic end-stage liver disease who manage very complex loading conditions. We had patients with uh, coronary artery disease. We had uh, patients with some valvular disease and so on. And what we saw there is again, obviously we measured these gradients, but we also used probably, you'll hear later on in the following talks this, this week, all these measurements of strain and strain rate and see what were the best uh, the ultrasound derived uh, metrics that sorry, <coughs> correlated best with this reference value of uh, reference index of systolic function. And this is the nice correlation we obtained for this uh, uh, ejection intraventricular pressure difference we obtained by the color M mode. Importantly, it was pretty much better than what we got with the strain, strain rate, obviously, or ejection fraction. And most importantly, we demonstrated here that it was very, very weakly correlated with preload or afterload and definitely much better than ejection fraction or stress-derived measurements. Stress did pretty well. Str uh, longitudinal strain here was quite afterload dependent. And you'll hear a lot of uh, papers in the, in the last 10 years trying to account what is the relationship between longitudinal strain and afterload and aortic stenosis and so on. But probably most of it is related to, not to so much to systolic function, but changes in afterload. This is one of the clinical applications we did. We, we, we were studying end stage liver disease because as I say, there's this hypothesis, probably you, some of you have heard about this condition named uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which end stage uh, uh, liver disease causes some sort of multi-organ syndrome related to cardiovascular dysfunction due to the fact that portal hypertension, hypertension leads to um, uh, increased permeability of the, of the, of the gut uh, barrier and translocation of, bac of bacteria from the uh, gut towards the blood. This induces an inflammatory response, which at the end produces central hypovolemia cardiovascular dysfunction, and eventually a bright condition. And this, this was a, uh, this concept of end-stage liver disease leading to cardiac dysfunction has been there for the last 10 years, and lots of authors have tried to prove the fact that when you have end-stage liver disease, eventually you, something is going wrong with your heart. So we tried to see what was happening with our particular method, and it we found was quite exactly the opposite. What we found is that this is a control population. These are different degrees of end-stage liver heart, liver disease. As your liver disease gets worse, the systolic function of your heart gets better. This is another metric of the degree of your uh, liver disease. As your, as your liver disease gets worse, your systolic function of your heart gets better. And why is that? That is much related to the amount of your uh, activation of the sympathetic of your uh, sympathetic nervous system so your sympathetic activity and increasing uh, uh, norepinephrine and other um, um, hormones in the in the blood increases your uh, uh, pump function the contractility of your heart and another important issue is that we showed that this was modulated by the fact you were ta taking beta blockers, a specific drug that modulates this sensitivity to SNS <coughs> activation. Interestingly, the, the authors who coined the, the, ter the, the, the term of, uh, of this cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which was who is Moller, he's a, a, a physiologist from uh, Norway, he recognized that the fact that we used the right tool made us the fact that we were seeing something that was actually completely changing around the paradigm uh, 
that we were demonstrating that it doesn't seem, at least at these uh, stages, that there's nothing wrong in your heart when you have chronic liver disease. So I think that's a nice example of showing you the whole picture from bringing some software out of a lab and understanding a clinical question from the clinician. Is what's going wrong with your heart when you have end-stage liver disease? And do we have to spe take a special care for your heart function in those conditions? Mm, uh, remember, some of these patients have to go under liver transplant, and that's a very stressful surgery. And it was believed that something could potentially go wrong with your heart when you were going that kind of situations. Now let's move on to see other location and what goes on. Look at here, I wanted to show you the fact at the end of the ejection, obviously, as this flow decelerates, your pressure gradient is reversed. You get a negative pressure gradient. You get higher pressure at your aortic valve than at your ventricle related to the fact that flow is decelerating until your aortic valve is closed, right? So it was pretty straightforward that the, 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 the intensity of this negative uh, peak there of your pressure gradient probably was related to the rate of relaxation of the ventricle. And pro we did this fancy engineering analysis you've probably heard about, which is called wave intensity analysis. Have you heard about that? We understand the physiological phenomena in terms of waves being uh, moving out or towards or away from the heart. And this is un to understand this, you have to bring up with this was uh, a previous speaker was talking about this understanding mechanics in terms of waves, right? This is waves propag uh, being propagated through the fluid from the heart towards the systemic circulation or from the systemic circulation towards the heart. And what we saw here is this relaxation behaves as a, obviously as a expansion wave pulling your flow back to the heart as the heart is becoming relaxed and it's propagating from the heart outwards through the aorta. And that relaxation wave was exactly taking place at the same time as the peak of that negative pressure gradient. So therefore, if time matches, probably the intensity also had something to do and the peak of that negative pressure gradient was related to the capability of your heart to relax during uh, the diastole. And that we reproduced it in, in, in a number of conditions. This, these are a bunch of patients in the cath lab where we can pretty well pre, uh, anticipate what is the degree of relaxation without the need of putting a pressure catheter inside the heart. So that's another important physiological question we can answer doing something with a big, bad, and ugly uh, uh, ultrasound scanner just doing, assuming your flow is 1D and doing very simple maths on that image. Other locations, uh, uh, we, I don't, uh, I'll skip a little bit of this. It has been published that obviously, if you look at here, this is flow, this is your left atrium here, right? This is the mitral valve, this is the ventricle. So this is flow coming from the atrium towards the ventricle, this is time. Here you have what's going on with pressure. If you look at this here, you'll see that pressure is still going down while flow is going in. You look at here, this time from there to there, flow is coming inside the ventricle while pressure is still coming down. So that's proving the fact that ventricle, the ventricle is pulling flow towards the atrium because its, its pressure is still coming down despite its being feeling. So you have a passive a passive balloon, if you start to get filling, your pressure needs to be going up. So if pressure is going down at the time you're being filled, obviously you're pulling flow and you have a negative pressure, you have suction from the ventricle to the atrium. And that, again, is something we can measure. This is the effect and gives you this corner here where the ventricle is actually acting as a syringe pulling flow from the atrium. And this pressure gradient is related to the functional class, the amount of dyspnea, and the outcomes of patients with a number of cardiac diseases. And again, as we showed, it's something, in another paper we showed, we can measure again using this uh, very, very simple 1D technology.
We did the same from the right heart. We can again measure, estimate this for the uh, right ventricular pressure gradient, estimate something as weird as the rate of relaxation of the right ventricle, not the left, which is something obviously that had never been done non-invasively in the heart before. Now for the second part of my talk, if we, I want to move a little bit further on. Now obviously, okay, if you look at it the way I was showing you, this could be 1D, this could be 1D, 1 and 1, but obviously there are many more things going on there. Why can't we look at flow in another way and we get the full picture, not only filling or ejection and get more information out of that. And there are a bunch of techniques you'll hear for, uh, quite uh, a lot further on. This is tracing by PIV contrast bubbles using ultrasound. Um, the problem is, as we showed, uh, as you can see here, you need very, very, very small interrogation boxes because if not, you can't measure with enough uh, spatial resolution. And what we showed here is, unfortunately, for obtaining these pressure maps, we need quite a lot of the temporal resolution. We proposed a different uh, uh, approach in which what we did was uh, solve continuity equation within uh, a, a conventional 2D flow image and uh, making use of uh, this uh, detection of the blood myocardium interface to do the, obtain the boundary conditions for solving this uh, continuity equation. We did the technology, we did some in vitro simulations experiments we obtained, we did some interleaving of frames to obtain much higher temporal resolution. And this was after processing, this is the raw data in a pulse duplicator. We did some uh, conventional PIV measurements there and we obtained that this technology of reconstructing the 2D velocity map out of conventional ultrasound images seemed to work pretty well and then this allowed us to obtain a full 2D representation of what's going on. Now, what can you expect? What's going on inside the heart? What is the conventional flow? What's going on there? You see, this is a very intricate geometry where the ventricle has, pro uh, 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 the aortic valve is pretty much in the same plane as the mitral valve there. So the flow has to go a very, very weird uh, trajectory to go from filling to outflow. And it builds this, there's a very huge change in uh, uh, inflow geometry from the mitral uh, valve uh, tips to the ventricular chamber. So there's a sudden expansion for flow, which obviously, obviously leads to the generation of a vortex rings that eventually advances through the, the ventricle from the mitral valve towards the chamber, gets bigger, uh, unpings from the filling jet, and eventually is taken towards ejection uh, across the aortic valves because as I say, they're pretty much in the same plane, the mitral, the inlet, and the aortic valve in the outlet. So we have to do, a flow does this very complex trajectory along the cardiac cycle. And what can we do, and what kind of information is there there? Well, we have this very, very basic paper, which is very provocative, saying, well, it's not the same to get this kind of filling than this one, and that might have its consequences on the physiology of the ventricle. Using this technology, it's easy to uh, understand what a vortex is because this is doing simple mathematics on the flow. And then you can characterize exactly what we call a vortex using this uh, Q index, which you probably know much better than I do. And there you can uh, uh, measure exactly the radius, the particulation, the position, and the energy that is there sitting in the vortex while flow comes in and flow comes out. Uh, yeah, in, in from the heart. Well, we did some validation. How well do these 2D based metrics of vortex size, position, radius and so on correlate with what's going on with the MRI? And we found they were doing pretty well and uh, that although we're assuming in order to apply this continuity equation that flow is mostly 2D, we got pretty good metrics and quite accurate measurements of what's going on with the flow and with the vortex. And that gave us the possibility of describing for the first time using conventional echo without the need of any contrast agents, what are the conditions of vortex. You see very well here, 
the, how the vortex is being built and that in, the, in every phase of the cardiac cycle you can obtain these metrics and get very nice representations in different populations. This is something that can be obtained with a conventional ultrasound scanner, uh, no risk for the patient, very cheap technique, and you can get the characteristics of flow going inside the heart, and we see the size, the circulation of this vortex structure. And what is that related to? Obviously, very importantly, to the amount of energy that is coming through the uh, inflow, the more energy you get, the bigger vortex, and the more circulation in the vortex you'll find, and obviously the bigger this disproportion between your mitral valve tips and your ventricular diameter, the, this size of the flow expansion always brings up a larger and more uh, energetic vortex. So. What are the consequences of that? Why has nature gone through this process of building up such a complex geometry for the heart? And what is the advantage of getting such a complex flow dynamics inside the left ventricle? There must be some reason there. We need to understand what's going on. This is a modeling uh, paper which was done uh, almost 10 years ago. What they, they simulated different uh, temporal activation patterns in order to you know, screw up completely what was the trajectory of flow. And what they found is was in terms of pressure and volume, there was not much of a difference. Now the question is, this, uh, a lot of people who, who have discussed this paper, they've said, well, it's not a matter of not being able to build up the pressure volume loop. It's a matter of how much pressure of the left atri atrium or how much energy does it take you to build up that pressure loop. It's mostly a matter of efficiency, okay? If you, uh, 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 you can develop the work, the heart can build up ex it external work, but probably it needs more energy because it, if it doesn't make use of this mechanism. I'll show you some data supporting that. This is a, a study we did exploratory, tell, tell healthy 20 healthy volunteers, 20 patients with a, dilated heart, non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, a very round and poorly contracted ventricle, and another 20 patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is exactly the opposite. You get a very small ventricle, very thick walls with a very small uh, ventricular chamber. Systolic function is normal, hypernormal in the early phases of the disease. But uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with your pump function. Your systolic function is okay, but your ventricle is small, your, your walls are thick, so you're getting some problems in the way you're being filled, right? Because it, your stiffness, your myocardial stiffness, is, is, is much worse. On the contrary, in the, on the contrary uh, uh, dilated ventricles, the walls are thinner, and it is believed that uh, uh, myocardial stiffness is below normal values because ex just because the fact that the uh, myocardial walls are thinner than controls. What we looked at is what was the role of the filling vortex in this particular geometries. So we measured this flow and then used, is any, anyone here ever heard about something called the vortex panel method used in aerospatial engineering? Well, what we do is if you do some maths out of the flow, and you have the geometry of the wall, you can simulate if you, what would be the flow being trajectories inside your chamber if you got this vortex and you put it inside the chamber, right? So this flow pattern we're obtaining here is the consequence just of the vortex. And the rotational flow field is the consequence if we, we did this exercise this would be vertical flow. This is the flow we measured. We subtract this from this. This would be the flow you would get in your heart if you didn't have any kind of vorticity in there. That would be sort of filling as a tube. So what you measure, we did this um, uh, obviously artificial decomposition in what would be your vertical flow and your completely irrational, uh, irritational flow. And that is what we see. You can get this you can build the synthetic uh, flow fields out of there, and this is what we get in terms of velocity, or probably more important, in terms of volume. 
So what are we seeing? That this vortex being built inside the ventricle, the bigger the vortex, the more flow is that it is pulling from the left atrium just because of a phenomenon of inertia. So as the filling phase is going through from the opening to closing of the mitral valve, the vortex is being built in, in normal patient, this is what it does, in it, it, the more the vortex ring is going round and round, it's entraining fluid from the, from the left atrium, pulling it through or across the mitral valve. If you have this small ventricle, no expansion of the chamber, your vortex is much smaller and you don't get this facilitation mechanism of filling just because of the fact of that vortex. So in some way, this vortex structure going on there, it's acting as a crankshaft. You get this pulsatile flow because the, 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 of the diastole has a number of phases. It's not continuously the same. You get intermittent flow due to the phases of the cardiac cycle. You get this sort of crankshaft mechanism of inertia, keeping the flow moving, that it keeps it the way it facilitates filling. And if you don't have the vortex, you're not aided by that mechanism. What else, or what other kind of information can you get out of flow? Well, you can do these uh, uh, um, uh, fancy measurements of tracing where flow goes. This was, does, this was done first using these Lagrangian coherent structures you've probably heard about, and then we can see very well what's, go what's happening with flow, and you can do this at different phases of the cardiac cycle, and you can get what's, what's going to happen with your blood along the cardiac cycle for a number of phases. You could also uh, do this uh, backwards, uh, what's going to go, what's going to move inside, what's going to happen with flow coming inside from the mitral valve. You can look at backwards through time, what, where is the flow that's going to eventually exit the, the, the ventricle. This is a nice application we did for looking at different responses to different uh, adjustments of pacemakers. And what we've seen, sorry, is that flow patterns of this, why, where is the blood sitting at the end of your cardiac cycle and what's going to happen for the following beats is different depending on how you set up these pacemakers. And fine-tuning pacemakers is something that is also a pending issue in cardiovascular medicine. You know, we have very complex devices now where we can uh, fine-tune the AV delay between the atrial contraction and the ventricular contraction. We also have to tune the interventricular delay. What is the time you want one ventricle to follow the other one to start the onset of contraction? And looking at these specific flow patterns can probably aid us in which are the best settings in the way to tune these pacemakers. I'm going to end up with this very, very important issue, and we believe there's a lot of potential of looking at flow in the heart in order to prevent this. Cardioembolic stroke is one of the major sources of disability in cardiovascular disease. About 30% of patients with a stroke have their, it is believed that the, uh, the clot in the brain came out from the heart, heart, went through the carotid arteries or the vertebral arteries, and eventually uh, stopped flow in the brain, right? So if we are able to do and progress in preventing clot formation inside the heart, it is understood that it, had a, it will have a major impact in disability caused by uh, uh, ischemic stroke in the brain, right? Now, the problem is current techniques for predicting, and the, obviously, you know, you can prevent this by starting anticoagulant therapy. You use drugs to lower the coagulation uh, capability of the blood, and uh, we can use these drugs to prevent uh, uh, the clot formation inside the heart. Now the problem is we have to balance the risk benefit of anticoagulation and then that is something that is not completely solved. We know quite well, or we thought we know, know, knew quite well the way to go for atrial fibrillation, a very specific cardiac arrhythmia, and we have 
very precise indications of what to do for preventing stroke in atrial fibrillation. But in other cardiac conditions which are related to stroke, we, we don't have such an accurate metrics in order to predict who should go on through uh, anticoagulation therapy for, her, for his life and who not. And for doing this, we've brought up these new metrics and, and, and provide maps. We use these fancy and mathematical methods. And uh, again, using data from velocity out of an ultrasound scanner or eventually from a 3D MRI scanner. Now we're not coloring velocity here. We're not coloring pressure maps here. We're coloring residence time of blood inside the heart. So the longer your blood is sitting inside the heart, the higher the risk it will activate coagulation and eventually will lead you to thrombosis inside the heart, right? Which is exactly what you don't want. And we've started some clinical studies looking at this using uh, ventricular assistance devices where you, you know thrombus formation is a minor risk, also looking at, uh, and obviously you don't just get the numbers, but you also get the exact distribution of these high stasis regions inside the ventricle and know we can, we can estimate what is the degree of contact of these static regions of blood with the myocardial wall and we can get very, very accurate numbers. This is a population of patients and who had a myocardial infarction and a large myocardial infarctions in which some part of the, of the heart is not contracting pro properly and we get these metrics of residence time, region size of the stagnant region, or the residence time of the stagnant region, or the contact with the perimeter. And as you can see here, patients who develop thrombus eventually in, during or immediately after a myocardial infarction have disturbed and pretty nice, nicely different patterns of flow. This is an example. These are two patients. Both of them have a abnormal motion in the apex due to a myocardial infarction. Those are the measurements we get out of the scanner. These are what we can see in flow going on uh, inside the ventricle. As you can see here, you get an apical region of stasis there. We don't like lots of blood lying there, which eventually won't wash, wash out, not for the following four seconds, which is something you wouldn't like, definitely worse than what you're seeing here. In this other patient who also has an apical infarct, whose ejection fraction is exactly the same as this one, but for, because of the distribution of flow, flow is entering in a different way, the ventricle, this apical uh, uh, static region there is much smaller. What happened with this patient? He eventually developed an apical thrombus. This one did not. So we believe this kind of uh, information, we've proved this in larger clinical trials, will definitely tell us something about physiology, something about the risk of stasis, and this could be uh, uh, adequate to try to <coughs> anticipate and target anticoagulation in this particular patients. So to conclude, uh, I think this is uh, the kind of things I'm trying to show you this morning. Recent advances in images, now we can obtain very robust measurements of intercardiac flows, and this can be obtained in the clinical setting, and you're gonna hear about this probably tomorrow a little bit more. You get these diastolic vortices, which are very important and are long-standing, and they have a physiological role. If you don't get that working properly, that would be leading to probably less efficiency in terms of filling and in terms of pumping, and this is uh, important in terms of mechanics, and this could be instrumental for a number of diseases. Just to summarize, I want to show you the kind of things other important authors have, have said about this clinical research. This issue about dilatation, impairing diastolic filling, this is, has been shown just simply by the fact of analyzing flow. The fact that it's not a ma only a matter of uh, the mechanics of the material of the, the myocardial wall, what's happening in the chamber, also impacts efficiency. These issues can be obtained using echocardiography. And this is one of another editorials that were pretty quite encouraging that they said to us, well, 
and a wider scale emphasizes a shift in our thinking that the heart is just more than a pressure uh, generating mechanism. So we have to understand cardiovascular physiology in terms of not only pressure but also flow and what's happening inside the heart. I also want to acknowledge the people who work with me. This is a bunch of MDs, engineers, physicists, uh, vets, uh, I don't know, technicians. Uh, this is a, whole, a, whole, a huge amount of work for a, a very crowded and busy clinical imaging lab. This is probably the task for a lot of people from the department, probably much beyond what you've seen specifically for the people. And we're currently hiring and we are very interested in the kind of profiles we, you are probably sitting there. So if you considering a potential pre-doc or post-doc position in a clinical lab, thinking about doing this kind of work, please uh, feel free to contact me and we'll be happy to give it a thought together. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comprehensive overview. Maybe just a real practical question to start with is one of the things that you mentioned before is that you said like you're doing animal models and then you do Millar catheters and this kind of things. In general, when we as modelers do this kind of work and we want to look at pressures and a lot of people are trying to do pressure volume loops and then we say like, okay, we need pressure measurements and you go to the cardiologist and the guy from the cat lab says like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I take pressures every day. And they give you the pressure measurements from the cat lab, which is obviously from a fluid-filled catheter. Yeah. So what's your experience with doing this kind of modeling research and then using fluid-filled regular clinical pressure measurements? Uh, a tough experience. <laughs> um, uh, the way, if you really... Um, if you want to get things done properly and if you want to, I mean, if you want to get accurate uh, uh, and science out of that, these uh, everyday measurements are not good enough. Well, they're good enough if you want some lumped time averaged values. I mean, if you want single scalars out of what is your end diastolic pressure, that's okay. What is your wedge pressure, that's okay. If you want the waveform, then it's not okay and probably you should ask for funding and train these guys to use high fidelity catheters. That's the way to go. So <laughs> That's my recommendation. Actually. It's not only that the engineers don't speak cardiology language, but the cardiologists don't speak engineering language neither. Uh, no, and, and probably nowadays the guys in the cath lab are no, not the most physiologically oriented anymore, unfortunately. But you can do that. I mean, it's it's... They're n they're n now you have this, uh, you, kn you, you, you know about these um, uh, pressure guide wires you use for the coronaries. The, these are pretty cheap and they're sitting there in every cath lab in the country. So you can put that into the ventricle and it'll provide you a very nice pressure waveform, just as good as if you had put it in the coronary. So that's a... It's only rather difficult to get the digital data out, at least in our experience. <laughs> well, well, maybe I can give you a hand. <laughs> Okay, uh, partially related to this also is like what some of the things that you're emphasizing is that actually with the clinical data, which is the Doppler data that you have, you can do pretty uh, much if you do it in a proper way. So the question is a little bit like when you see that if you look in the echo lab, people take like Doppler traces, especially pulse Doppler traces from the valves every day, and this is like routine. Mm -hmm. and the only thing they measure from it is maybe EA ratio or EE prime or whatever you would measure from it. The question is a little bit, what is your impression? Is this underused, understudied data, or is this old fashioned that we need to go to 4D MRI because that's the only thing that can give us information? Well, the way I, we've looked at it, I think there is, the, it, it, it's a continuum. I mean, there is some information out of the post-wave Doppler data because, you know, regarding whatever, uh, no care whatever is going on in between, they've already, you know, outcomes between EA wave and outcomes has been linked. So uh, we know from an engineer perspective, most of the assumptions in the middle are wrong, but the fact that there is some, you know, empirical relationship between metrics that 
is okay and tells, well, give me that information because I know it's going to help me decide what's going to be the outcome. Now, for every, what, what is the, the, the balance between complexity and clinically relevant information? I mean, the whole world, what I'm trying to explain here, the whole world of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy is the paradigm of wrong science out of the wrong technique. So you were looking at diastolic function with the EA wave and the DTI data and uh, ejection fraction and stroke volume, which if you've ever seen a cirrhotic patient, is a completely rubbish. I mean, it's, it's, it's loading conditions are so uh, abnormal that there's no... Imp so if you want to go into... Uh, there's a terribly important field nowadays where this kind of things that makes your life a little bit worse in the everyday echo lab is, very, is going to become very, very important. That is in oncology. And, you know, nowadays, most of the drugs being used to treat cancer have some sort of an impact on your ventricular function. So you have to monitor your ventricular function very carefully. Eventually, if someone in the cardiac side says, watch out, something is going wrong with your heart, then you're telling the oncologist, stop the therapy, and he's going to neglect therapy, potentially able to... Uh, get rid of the tumor, uh, eventually cure that patient, and you're going to make him stop him because you're going to say something is going wrong in your heart. So there you have to make sure you got your metrics right and you got your reproducibility and you got the right indices. And that's where we believe this kind of, you know, more sophisticated issues could be helpful. The same for stroke prevention, maybe. There may be for, you know, some sort of Subtle measurements of diastolic function, definitely we have to go into more complex flow analysis than what we're doing in everyday clinical practice. Yes. And maybe just, again, from your experience, what you see is like you've been working in your lab on the Doppler measurement and trying to extract information out of there, trying to do something clinically relevant and get that information. On the other hand, all of these tools, at some point, the only way to get them into clinical practice if the companies take them over. But the experience seems to be that the companies want like fashionable, new methods, 3D, even more sophisticated, instead of going to some of these things that you can get hemodynamic information. That's, that's, that, yeah, that, that is a very, 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 very important issue. And I'm not sure we've done things right. We've got, we, st we have established, I mean, for when we started, we did establish some relationships with some of the companies, which actually brought up some patent filing of some of these tools by the company and eventually never put it into the scanners. So that was a pretty nightmare. And uh, why did that happen? I can't give you the answer. Uh, as you know better than I do, most of the companies don't need to demonstrate any clinical impact of putting a new, a new bell and whistle in a scanner. Okay, they just want to the, all that they are asked by the FDA or by the EC mark or whoever is that if they say three, it's close to three and it, it does no harm if it's a diagnostic tool, okay? So nice new bells and whistles for diagnostic modalities. It's pretty easy to put in, inside the scanners. You just make sure it makes no harm. Make sure that if you say three, it's not 30, it's not 300. It's something, something between zero and 15 that's good enough okay and then you're allowed to put it in your scanner you can make your cell your machine better than other vendors now why is it more difficult to get this kind of information out well it's it's very interesting it, once it's published then if the technique is published then one vendor won't have things so easy to put it being protected so other vendors don't have it. So it's not as fancy as trying to make sure they only have this, at least for the uh, following years, they have some sort of advantage over the competitors. So there are a number of reasons. We, are, we have undergone some patent protection of some of the things I've shown you before. And eventually, I think there's a new market coming up that are companies who are not so much, it's sort of a smaller companies at least for the early phases, they're going to bring up, they're going to develop these tools, they're going to hire engineers. Probably in the long term, they're going to be 
you know, bought by the large manufacturers. But in the meantime, they're going to provide some sort of, and they're starting to, to come up, some sort of uh, processing algorithms and, you know, something that is uh, straightforward for the clinician. You get the data out. This is happening for the, I don't know, FFR measurements out of the CT. There are small companies being built up where you get the data out of the modalities, out of the scanners, you threw it through the cloud, you get a server locally or whatever, they provide you the measurements, and that is where the value is. And I think there is a potential market there for these uh, post-processing based uh, technologies. Yeah. Any questions? Everyone didn't understand anything or is in shock or is, is simply hungry? Thank, thank you for the presentation, it was very nice. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first, uh, you partially answered before, and it was uh, about the balance between uh, a very complex uh, technique and the assumption uh, we, we have to accept for using very easy technique. And, and also, um, what I think it's still uh, not mentioned was uh, the operator dependencies of uh, ECHO. Mm -hmm. which is uh, quite a big problem. Mm -hmm. And the second question was about um, the resident times, mm -hmm. which uh, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, it was related about the fact that uh, maybe the, the flow moves in perpendicular to the, the field of view you have. Yeah. And so maybe I will ask an answer about the possibility to use 4D flow to, exactly. to validate yes. this technique. Good. That's very, very, very good questions. Um, we every time we get a new index out of these, we do all the reproducibility issues, and not only for the processing part, which is usually easy, we also go through the acquisition part, right? So we get the same patient. One of the uh, sonographers come out, comes out of the room. Another one moves in and starts the procedure from the very beginning again, and so we get true retest. Uh, reproducibility. The more complex your image acquisition process is, the, more, the lower your reproducibility will be. That is, and it's also, I mean, 100% reproducibility is not true, not even for, I, do, I would say, uh, MRI volumes, which is supposed to be the gold standard. I can give you figures and you can find papers out of 15, 20% uh, variability for measuring in systolic or endostolic volumes out of MRI. So, Careful, the more complex technology is not necessarily equivalent to better reproducibility. And regarding this uh, flat flow assumption for measuring residence time, you're absolutely right. And uh, our next uh, uh, approach, and we have already done, the software is ready, is obtaining resident maps out of 3D MRI data. Yes, definitely, that's very important. The problem is doing some in vitro validation for residence time uh, it's not as easy because eventually we, we, we've been thinking about different models, maybe uh, using different dyes in, in vitro simulators to see if we are able to, to get some robust you know, end-to-end -end validation. When we say four seconds, it is actually four seconds. No? But uh, we are going through that. We'll eventually probably make it. But in the meanwhile, yes, I do definitely think there is going to be a major improvement if we are able to obtain uh, resident state maps out of the flow uh, measurements in 3D out of phase contrast, yes, definitely. Other questions? Uh, in the technique where you calculate the vortices uh, using the continuity equation, do you have any kind of sample uh, um, transfer of one image to another one? Or do you keep each nope. image separated? No, uh, we do some interleaving. We get a, a number of beats to build up, and we do some interleaving to, to build up the velocity map, right? So the, the, the velocity map does have, have some temporal continuity and some temporal smoothing and some temporal filtering. But the vortex detection is being done frame by frame. So we don't, uh, that, that is based on the velocity field. We don't do anything special or any uh, um, spline fitting or any smoothing 
for the vortex futures now. Uh, do you think the temporal resolution of uh, ultrasound plays a role in the results that you have, me meaning like miss some information? Uh, well, uh, temporal resolution of ultrasound is the best we can get. I mean, uh, uh, and we've incorporated this into leaving, which makes you it even better. Um, it depends what you want to measure. I mean, if, if this vortex thing, the vortex uh, metrics are rather smooth because, you know, it takes almost the whole cardiac cycle. Whatever is happening in isovolumic phases is much faster. So their temporary resolution, it depends what you want to measure. Pressure gradients, if you do the, our first approach based on temporal and spatial derivation, there you need very high temporal resolutions. But as you probably know, there are other methods which are not so dependent on, on temporal resolution. So it depends. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, uh, regarding what we have just said about uh, MRI, uh, according to your opinion, uh, do you think that we need more uh, comparison study among uh, ultrasound, ultrasound and uh, MRI? Um. It depends what you're trying to measure. For, for some things you do, for others you don't. Um, I'm not sure what the gold standard is for depending what you're accounting for flow. The problem for 4D MRI obviously is, is sensitivity. You make sure you get the right bank for exactly what is your window of flow velocities you want to measure if you're and that's not, it may be not that easy to adjust. And obviously, your, uh, the, the resolution of your 4D data set is very, very, very closely related to acquisition time. So if you want quite a lot of temporal resolution, spatial resolution, you're going to go through hours of image acquisition time or mm, some of the fancy new algorithms where you can do it a little bit shorter. But it's... For, for these, you know, 2D ejection fraction. That's a, every, every clinician. I mean, if you go to the hospital tomorrow, oh, it, 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 everything is based on 2D ejection fraction. We know it's rubbish. We know we have from 3D echo, biplane echo, MRI, CT, uh, nuclear medicine where you get more robust measurements of ejection fraction. The clinician said, will answer you, so what? You know, clinical validation papers were done with N-mode derived ejection fraction. And we're still guiding a lot of decision making with techniques which are not, which we know do not meet a number of assumptions. But for a lot of things, they're good enough. So uh, it's a trade-off, how much validation you need where to obtain it, how much you need to make sure you match the MRI results. I don't know, it depends. And the second question about uh, your work. Uh, how do you think it could be possible to improve uh, communication among uh, physicians and engineers? I, I can give you the answer to that. I mean, if you want, you can have a beer with me later on. Uh, <laughs> the main answer is you want the engineers sitting in the hospital. You want the engineers sitting as close to the patient as you can. That is my particular view. Um, you want the patient, we want the engineer to understand the way we work, the way we think, the way, the kind of questions we need to, and, you know, sort of to sense the impact it has on uh, everyday clinical practice. So my personal view is you have to move by your engineers closer to the clinical field and interact together? Definitely, yes. That's my personal answer to that question. And that's my personal experience, plus that it takes 10 years in order to... <laughs> yeah, it, takes a, it <laughs> takes a while, it takes a while. <laughs> Maybe just also still as a comment on what you ask in, in, with regard to the MRI. I mean, when you look at the modeling engineers, 95% of them use MRI as starting images. But if you look in cardiology, 95% yeah. of the images is echo and less than 5% is MRI. So I think using the echoes to get information out, we really have to start thinking as an engineer in that direction. I think that's quite important. What, what, and, uh, going back to your previous question, another thing that is important is you have to move 
uh, medicine out of exactly mean the problem with medical school it's very very close we're having we're doing the same training for the last 50 years uh, um, you know the kind of question I get from my fellows or my residents at the hospital they say well I'm a cardiologist you know and I always have to reply yeah you know you come from a scientific scientific field okay this is not an art this is not about literature you know maths you know physics you went that through school so we also have to do a lot of work on our side and I think you guys in the engineer work are probably um, getting closer to open up your mind and understanding that your the, 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 the kind of material you're studying in, 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 in university has to be mostly oriented to different tools you're eventually going to need to make your way out as soon as you get out of school. In the medical path you just want to you know get the knowledge specifically of what you want to treat your patient tomorrow and you're not caring if probably that's got nothing to do with what the kind of skills you're going to need 20 years on which is probably more related to I don't know dealing with computers dealing with physics dealing with physiology and not just you know learning the basics of the clinical guidelines which is something that eventually will come out of a computer Okay, thank you very much okay. for coming. Thank you for the clinical insight. <laughs> I just want to ask you five more minutes uh, before having lunch, um, because one of the important things is the way we can, the only way we can organize this type of events is also if we have some help and if we collaborate with some organizations and Jerome is going to tell you something quickly about this. Okay, so uh, thank you, Bob. Well, uh, thank you all uh, first uh, for being here at this, at this summer school. Uh, so you've seen you know, the price of summer school is, ex is extremely low because th the objective, you cannot make it for free, but uh, the objective is to make it so as cheap as possible. So to, to have a maximum of opportunity to, uh, have to attract students here. And uh, we have very prominent speakers that are coming from different areas of Spain and, and Europe and uh, so all those people are coming uh, for free. For we take their travel and their stay here, but uh, it's it's really uh, there because they're willing to share uh, their extra knowledge uh, with us here, and and we we have to be thankful for that. And uh, here, the scientific societies play a huge role, and and this is what I would like to introduce you uh, shortly. So there are uh, two main uh, societies that uh, are underlining, uh, underlying this, uh, this event. So this uh, first, the DPH Institute, uh, who is co-promoter of the event, and then the European Society of Biomechanics and, and, and the local part of it, who are, uh, also sponsoring the, who are also sponsoring the event. Then we have other sponsors, uh, so Cardio Function. So I don't know if Bart later on will speak about this. It's Marie Curie Training Network. And, uh, and then, so we have uh, Simulan Foundation QS, who are, uh, who are funding uh, awards. So having a, winning an award is always good for the CV, so, so it's, it's very nice to have that too. So uh, I will start with uh, European Society of Biomechanics. I don't know if someone you uh, know this site. It's very well established, it has been founded in 1976. It has started with 20 scientists, so today, it has uh, over uh, 1,000 uh, members. And then the goal is to encourage research, disseminate knowledge, and promote progress in biomechanics. So large part, of, as you've seen, and as you will see, large part of uh, computational uh, research in biomedical engineering in involves biomechanical uh, component. So, so having a representation of society so makes, makes uh, fully sense. And uh, so this society is, does indeed a lot of things. So uh, most important event is an annual conference. So this year it will be in SEVI in, uh, by the beginning of, of uh, July. And uh, so most of the money of the society is, is used uh, to fund awards. So and most of the awards are indeed awards for students, awards for junior researchers. So uh, we have Beach Best PhD Thesis Award, uh, which is uh, a very competitive uh, award and very well recognized across uh, Europe. Then we have the Student Awards, which are awards for the 
best abstract in presentation at the, at the Congress. So we have traveler works also to, um, to, to fund the travel of, uh, of people who do serve it then to the, to the conference. And uh, we also have each year mobility awards. So mobility awards, uh, so funds uh, PhD students to spend three months, three to four months of their PhD time in another European uh, laboratory in order to uh, foment collaboration. And if it's interdisciplinary, so even better. So it, it fully follows then the philosophy of virtual physiological uh, humans. And it also gives access to junior scientists to very prestigious awards. So there's uh, Stephen Awards, Stephen Perrin Awards. So sometimes it's a very senior scientist who wins it, so uh, nearby uh, retirement. And uh, sometimes it's uh, PhD students. So I think that's, that's also very nice then to have this, this kind of uh, things. And then we have student workshops, mentoring awards, and job offers. So in those society, everyone pays a fee. Uh, so the fee is very low. I think for students, it's uh, 20 euros a year. And, uh, and th this, is, this money is very important because this money allows uh, so the promotion of organizations like this summer school uh, allows the organization of uh, awards if you apply to competitive fellowship in the future. So that's very important then uh, to, to, to have an award or a couple of awards in your, in your CV. If you don't have, it's not dramatic, but if you have much better. So the more opportunities you have, then the, of course, uh, the better. And then the you know, <coughs> Virtual Physiological Human uh, Institute, so it's currently following uh, a very similar path uh, in order to uh, support research, so broader than biomechanics, really what we're covering here. And uh, it, has started, uh, it has started as an initiative, so it's back 1997 uh, and has followed several steps, as, as you can see here. So to promote the use of computational tools in, in medicine, so for, for personalized care solutions, reduced need for experiments on animals, more holistic approach to medicine, and preventive approach to treatment of disease. So then the object objective is, is to take so what is uh, available in basic science, basic numerical uh, tools, and theory, coupling it to biology lately, and then further to medicine, and there, uh, really foster, uh, really foster so an improved, um, an improved healthcare system, so both for the patients and, and for the society. So here or so, there's a huge effort of uh, a lot of persons uh, that are uh, giving uh, time and, and personal resources to the society. There is some membership uh, that's for students. It's 10 euros per year, so it's, it's really symbolic. All those of you who have registered, you have your membership uh, incorporated in the, in the fees. So, uh, so you're, you're contributing to a nice project. And as for the activities, so there is a biannual conference where you also have uh, student men mentorships, uh, awards, et cetera. Uh, then we have so the annual summer school that uh, right now we are uh, doing here in Barcelona. And we also have uh, trimestral webinars. So uh, those webinars, um, so if you're a member of the VPH Institute, you're receiving all the news. And uh, those webinars so aim uh, to uh, bring to everyone uh, researchers who are normally not really available. If you go to a conference, there are these researchers, you can not get in touch with them because they all have very important things to do, meetings, etc. And they don't answer the emails if you email them in general. So, um, so here through this webinar, so we want to create a special opportunities. And uh, so for example, you have the next webinar. This is a clinician who is using uh, computational tools. Uh, we'll have a webinar, so sp special webinar, so uh, in live uh, from the VPH Summer School on, um, on Wednesday afternoon, so given by, the, by an officer of the Food and Drug Administration. And, um, and uh, so what makes the difference uh, between uh, common scientific societies and the VPH Institute, that the VPH Institute is, is really committed so to, uh, to foster our activity and our opportunities of, uh, of funding and uh, of finding uh, jobs later, 
so through the exploitation of, of what we're doing. And of course, this can only be possible if we pass through uh, policy, uh, through policy exercises. So they're working very closely to the commission. That's a lot of years of, of efforts. And now uh, basically the European Commission is recognizing this effort and the importance and we can see it so through the H2020 uh, programs and other programs uh, which generates a lot of opportunities then for, for us. Um, yep. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sir. So I think it's important to have a look to these websites. You can get a lot of information there, especially for the young students, as you say, awards and things that are important.